Let's do it by E.B. White. Chapter 19, The Accept. Next morning, when the first light came into the sky and the sparrows stirred in the trees, when the cows rattled their chains and the rooster crowded and the early automobiles went whispering along the road, Wilbur awoke and looked for Charlotte. He saw her up overhead in a corner near the back of his pen. She was very quiet. Her eight legs were spread wide. She seemed to have shrunk during the night. Next to her, attached to the ceiling, Wilbur saw a curious object. It was a sort of sack or cocoon. It was peach colored and looked as though it were made of cotton candy. Are you awake, Charlotte? He said softly. Yes, came the answer. What is that nifty little thing? Did you make it? I did, indeed, replied Charlotte in a weak voice. Is it a plaything? Plaything? I should say not. It is my exact, my magnum opus. I don't know what a magnum opus is, said Wilbur. That's Latin, explained Charlotte. It means great work. This exact is my great work, the finest thing I have ever made. What's inside it? asked Wilbur. Eggs? Five hundred and fourteen of them, she replied. Five hundred and fourteen, said Wilbur. You're kidding. No, I'm not. I counted them. I got started counting, so I kept on just to keep my mind occupied. It's a perfectly beautiful exec, said Wilbur, feeling as happy as though he had constructed it himself. Yes, it is pretty, replied Charlotte, patting the sack with her two front legs. Anyway, I can guarantee that it is strong. It's made out of the toughest material I have. It is also waterproof. The eggs are inside and it will be warm and dry. Charlotte said over dreamily, Are you really going to have 514 children? If nothing happens, yes, she said. Of course they won't show up till next spring, Wilbur noticed that Charlotte's voice sounded sad. What makes you sound so downhearted? I should think you'd be terribly happy about this. Oh, don't pay any attention to me, said Charlotte. I just don't have much pep anymore. I guess I feel sad because I won't ever see my children. What do you mean you won't see your children? Of course you will. We'll all see them. It's going to be simply wonderful next spring in the barn cellar with 514 baby spiders running around all over the place. And the geese will have a new set of goslings and the sheep will have their new lambs. Maybe, said Charlotte quietly. However, I have a feeling I'm not going to see the results of last night's efforts. I don't feel good at all. I think I'm languishing, to tell you the truth. Wilbur didn't understand the word languish, and he hated to bother Charlotte by asking her to explain, but he was so worried he felt he had to ask. What does languishing mean? It means I'm slowing up, feeling my age. I'm not young anymore, Wilbur, but I don't want you to worry about me. This is your big day today. Look at my web. Doesn't it show up well with the dew on it? Charlotte's web never looked more beautiful than it looked this morning. Each strand held dozens of bright drops of early morning dew. The light from the east struck it and made it all plain and clear. It was a perfect piece of designing and building. In another hour or two, a steady stream of people would pass by, admiring it and reading it and looking at Wilbur and marveling at the miracle. As Wilbur was studying the web, a pair of weak whiskers and a sharp face appeared. Slowly, Templeton dragged himself across the pen and threw himself down in the corner. And back, he said in a husky voice, what a night. The rat was swollen to twice his normal size. His stomach was as big around as a jelly jar. Oh, look at its stomach. Really big. What a night, he repeated hoarsely. What feasting and caressing, a real gorge. I must have eaten the remains of 30 lunches. Never have I seen such livings and everything well ripened and seasoned with the passes of time and the heat of the day. Oh, it was rich, my friend, rich. You ought to be ashamed of yourself, said Charlotte in disgust. It would serve you right if you had an acute attack of indigestion. Don't worry about my stomach. 
ignore this Templeton. It can't handle anything. And by the way, I've got some bad news. As I came past the pig next door, the one that calls himself uncle, I noticed the blue tag on the front of his pen. That means he, he has won first prize. I guess you're late, Wilbur. You might as well relax. Nobody's going to hang any metal on you. Furthermore, I wouldn't be surprised if Zuckerman changes his mind about you. Wait till he gets hankering for some fresh pork and smoked damn crisp bacon. He'll take the knife to you, my boy. Be still, Templeton, said Charlotte. You're too stuffed and bloody to know what you're saying. Don't pay attention to him, Wilbur. Wilbur tried not to think about what the rat had just said. He decided to change the subject. Templeton, said Wilbur, if you weren't so dopey, you wouldn't have noticed that Charlotte has made an ag exec. She's going to become a mother. For your information, there are 514 eggs in that peachy little sack. Is this true? asked the rat. I'm the sack suspicious, suspiciously. Yeah, it's true, sighed Charlotte. Congratulations, murmured Templeton. This has been a night. He closed his eyes, pulled some straw over himself, and dropped off into a deep sleep. Wilbur and Charlotte were glad to be rid of him for a while. At nine o'clock, Mr. Arable's truck rolled into the fairground and came to a stop at Wilbur's pen. Everybody climbed out. Look, cried Frank, look at Charlotte's trap. Look what it says. The grown-ups and the children joined hands and stood there, studying the new sign. Humble, said Mr. Zuckerman. Now, isn't that just a word for Wilbur? Everyone rejoiced to find that the miracle of the web had been repeated. Wilbur gazed up lovingly into their faces. He looked very humble and very grateful. Fern winked at Charlotte. Larby soon got busy. He poured a bucket of warm slops into the trough and, while Wilbur ate his breakfast, Larby scratched him gently with a smooth stick. Wait a minute, cried Avery. Look at this. He pointed to the blue tag on Uncle's pen. This pig has won first prize already. The Zuckerman and the Arable stared at the tag. Mr. Mrs. Zuckerman began to cry. Nobody sat over it. They just stared at the tag. Then they stared at Uncle. Then they stared at the tag again. Larvy took out an enormous handkerchief and blew his noise very loud. So loud, in fact, that the noise is heard by stable boys over at the horse barn. Can I have some money? asked Fern. I want to go out on the midway. You stay right where you are, said her mother. Tears came to Fern's eyes. What's everybody crying about? asked Mr. Zuckerman. Let's get busy, Edith. Bring the buttermilk. Mrs. Zuckerman wiped her eyes with her handkerchief. She went to the truck and came back with a gallon jar of buttermilk. Bad time, said Zuckerman. Cheerfully, he and Mrs. Zuckerman and Avery climbed into Wilbur's pen. Avery slowly poured the buttermilk in Wilbur's head and back, and as it trickled down his sides and cheeks, Mr. and Mrs. Zuckerman rubbed it into his hair and skin. Passers-by stopped to watch. Pretty soon, quite a crowd had gathered. Wilbur grew beautifully white and smooth. This morning, sun shone through his pink ears. He didn't speak and stop pink next door, remarked one bystander. But it's cleaner, that's what I like. So do I, said another man. He's humble too, said a woman, reading the sign on the web. Everybody who visited the pig pen had a good word to say about Wilbur. Everyone admired the well, and of course nobody noticed Charlotte. Suddenly a voice was heard on the loudspeaker. Attention please, it said. Will Mr. Homer Zuckerman bring his famous pig to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand? A special award will be made there in 20 minutes. Everyone is invited to attend. Create your pig, please. Mr. Zuckerman and report to the judge's booth promptly. For a moment after this announcement, the Arables and the Zuckermans were unable to speak or move. Then Avery picked up a handful of straw and threw it high in the air and gave a loud yell. The straw fluttered down like confetti into Florence's hair. Mr. Zuckerman hugged Mrs. Zuckerman. Mr. Arable kissed Mrs. Arable. Avery kissed Wilbur. Lurby shook hands with everybody. Fern hugged her mother. A Avery hugged Fern. Mrs. Arable hugged Mrs. Zuckerman. Up overhead, in the shadows of the ceiling. Wow, look at that. Everybody's happy now. Charlotte. 
crouched unseen, her front leg encircling her egg sac. Her heart was not being beating as strongly as usual, and she felt weary and old. But she was sure at last that she had saved Wilbur's life, and she felt peaceful and contented. We have no time to lose, shouted Mr. Zuckerman. Verby, help me with the crate. Can I have some money? asked Fern. You wait, said Mrs. Arable. Can't you see everybody is busy? Put that empty buttermilk jar into the truck, commanded Mr. Arable. Avery grabbed the jar and rushed it to the truck. Does my hair look all right? asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Looks fine, snapped Mr. Zuckerman. As he and Lurby set the crate down in front of Wilbur, you didn't even look at my hair, said Mrs. Zuckerman. You're all right, Edith, said Mrs. Arable. Just keep calm. Templeton, asleep in the straw, heard the commotion and awoke. He didn't know exactly what was going on, but when he saw the man shoving Wilbur into the crate, he made up his mind to go along. He watched his chance, and when no one was looking, he crept into the crate and buried himself in the straw at the bottom. All righty, boys, cried Mr. Zuckerman. Let's go. He and Mr. Arable and Lurby and Avery grabbed the crate and boosted it over the side of the pen and up into the truck. Fern jumped aboard and sat on top of the crate. She still had straw in her hair and looked very pretty and excited. Mr. Arable started the motor. Everyone climbed in, and off they drove to the judge's booth in front of the grandstand. As they passed the ferris wheel, Fern gazed up at it and wished she were in the top, topmost car with Henry Fussy at her side.